Hi everyone, my name is Cintilla Chingaipe and I am moderating today's session for the Melbourne Writers' Festival. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the country from where this conversation is happening, um, the lands of the Kulin Nation, particularly those of the Wurundjeri and the Bon Wurrung peoples. I would also like to extend um, that respect to the elders and elders of all communities um, and cultures across Australia who might be joining us in this conversation. Um, I'd also like to thank the Melbourne Writers' Festival for making this um, conversation possible. I am very, very excited to introduce our very special guest. Um, I've sort of been devouring this book, um, Hood Feminism, um, just so much. I've been taking so much and really um, excited to launch into the conversation. But before I introduce um, our guest, um, I'd also like to let you know that you can buy um, the book, Hood Feminism, through the bookseller um, for the Melbourne Writers' Festival. That's through readings. So if you go onto the Melbourne Writers' Festival website, um, you can buy the book, which I think you should. Um, and also you can join in the conversation online um, with the appropriate hashtags. So, Mickey Kendall is a writer and speaker whose work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, The Guardian, Time, Ebony, Essence and elsewhere. She's discussed race, feminism, violence in Chicago, tech and pop culture in various forms of media, as well as at universities across the world. So please welcome Mickey. Hi, Mickey. Hi, thank you for having me. I, I feel like I should have like a big um, round of applause just to mimic a, a real life audience, uh, given that we, we don't have that interaction. So I am um, going to you know, pretend I am the thousands of people that are tuning in um, today. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge that we're obviously meeting during very difficult times. You know, we uh, are all sort of locked down, particularly here in Victoria, in Melbourne. Um, we're under um, stage three restrictions and we haven't been able to leave because of the coronavirus pandemic. Obviously, that's something that's impacting the United States as well. Um, and I'd like to take this time to just, yeah, acknowledge that it is a difficult time for a lot of people. And I hope that um, everyone's holding up okay and that their loved ones are well and safe. Um, how are you holding up, Nikki? I am actually doing pretty well. So the U.S. has a weird thing where our governors and individual states are sort of setting I know this isn't going to make any sense to anybody outside the U.S., but the standards for shelter in place and different phases are set by our governors, not at a federal level. So I happen to be in a state with a really good governor. He's not necessarily the most popular guy in town, but he actually likes scientists. So I'm, I'm okay. a fan of him and his like of scientists, if I don't like anything else. So it has been okay. It's not great. Um, deaths in my state are over 100,000, but given how bad it is elsewhere in the U.S. and obviously elsewhere in the world, I feel a little weird saying that it's good or bad here. It's just not as bad as it could be, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so I guess, you know, I've been reading this book, um, and I'll just show everyone again. Um, all of you know my time during lockdown and I have to say I've there's a lot that resonated obviously um, and there's a lot that was so specific to the current moment um, and I just sort of thought that perhaps we could frame our conversation some of it anyway in in the context of not just the pandemic but also the global Black Lives Matter movement which obviously has its roots um, there in the United States so I think my first question for you is why would feminism so hood feminism is the lived feminism of women in the inner cities here in rural communities and low income and sometimes no income to speak of communities. And it's the things that you do to take care of yourself and your neighbors when times are hard, when, you know, the money is funny and, and it's the end of the month. And so I grew up, um, I think for the Australian context, I didn't quite grow up in the projects. I grew up uh, project adjacent, so not a housing, not a public housing setup, but uh, the neighborhood that would be right next to that, in an apartment near there. Does that make sense? Yeah. In Australia, okay. So we, I went to a school that was 99% black, 99% um, low income. And I grew up with neighbors who had to make sure that we made it, each other made it through the month. Then as an adult, I was on our version of public assistance after I, my military service. And again, it was the same thing. 
it was about how feminism is really lived work. It is not just the theories in the academy or the saying the right words. It matters, what you do matters as a feminist. And I, my, but my best experiences with supportive feminist work have often been in places where people would say that's not a feminist issue. I guess what was, for me, what seems to be at the heart of um, uh, hood feminism is the concept of intersectionality. So obviously, um, you know, Kimberly Crenshaw's work around that. And in terms of thinking about some of the issues that you highlight in the book of, of how mainstream feminism has overlooked um, so many issues, particularly whether it's poverty, education, um, gun violence, um, and thinking about it in the context of the, um, of the pandemic, it's been very striking to sort of see that, and, and also unsurprising given what you've written in your book, that the hardest hit um, as a result of the pandemic have been predominantly women of colour who tend to be frontline workers. Um, and again, I can't help but think about what you write about how mainstream feminism overlooks these women when we're having that conversation, particularly even with the pandemic, who's the hardest hit, who's bearing the brunt um, of the economic toll. So one of the things about this and why, why it's hood feminism is that right now, for instance, in America, we're having conversations about whether or not the kids will be able to go back to school, okay? And there's a very good argument to be made about forming parenting pods or co-teaching pods where it's a small group. And the thing is though, that means only the kids of those with the money and the access and the privilege are guaranteed an education right now. We're, we're basically failing the children of the same workers we say are so essential to let the rest of us stay home. We're also failing to recognize that those workers and their children needed support before now, and they need more support now. You can't say that someone is an essential worker and still keep paying them a minimum wage that doesn't allow them to afford housing, much less medical care, much less you know any of the dozen and one other things, including access to ways to care for themselves if they get sick. And so we've created sort of an unsustainable system and I know that people are going to say, well, the welfare state costs so much. And I've definitely seen this even in terms of Australian media, that there's an idea that poor people are taking from everyone else. But functionally, what we're saying here is that the people who clean our, our streets, who clean our homes sometimes, who are working in the grocery store, who are cleaning up the hospitals, we're saying that they don't matter as much, that they don't count as much as the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, as people with jobs that we recognize as being valuable. Well, everyone's work is valuable. There's no such thing as unskilled labor. And we're failing, and now we're seeing that crisis play out. And the thing is, after the frontline workers get hit with, with COVID, the people they're caring for, the people who they're bringing supplies to, are then their risk is increased. So we need a system and a, and a a logic around how we're treating women of color who are more likely to be caretakers in any given community so that they are able to take care of themselves, not just expect them to take care of everyone else. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about, I mean, I'm hearing what you're saying and I was thinking about it in the context of, um, I have a friend who is working as a nurse and she's a woman of color and she's basically at the front lines, but she's sort of um, been frustrated with the uh, major conversation she's you know, let's have a social media moment to show solidarity for frontline workers when her argument is, I'm not being paid enough, you know, here I am risking my life and I'm not, I, I'm, I don't have the adequate um, uh, tools and conditions and resources that allow me to really function at my best. And I couldn't help but really look at those disparities. On the one hand, there's this conversation sort of going, yes, aren't frontline workers amazing? Look at all that they're doing and sacrificing their heroes. And as you're saying, you know, we're not um, compensating them adequately for the work that they're doing nor do we recognise it as, um, you know, worth the value that, you know, someone else, you know, would be, would be earning. Right. And then, you know, we, we're underpaying people. And one of the complaints often is that, well, why are people trying to go out? Why are people violating the restrictions? The answer, unfortunately, yes, some people are spoiled. But the answer, unfortunately, is that for many people, they can't afford to stay home. They can't afford, like your friend, she doesn't, I don't, the U.S. had a real problem with even putting 
protective gear on frontline workers. Um, and I don't want to project our issues onto the world, but I will say that I noticed that frontline workers all over the world seem to be really in desperate conditions where they didn't have a place even to get enough rest. There weren't enough of them. We hadn't funded the programs to make sure there were enough people in medical facilities, never mind anywhere else. You know, and we sort of pretended that sanitation and all of these other jobs that we think are disgusting but are very necessary were just kind of happening in some of this where they were taking care of themselves. And now we're saying you're a hero. Heroes tend to die in obscurity um, and of poverty because we love a hero when they're saving us. We don't necessarily think heroes should re be rewarded. And we love to say that, you know, doing good deeds is its own reward. I don't know if you have that saying there. And it's sure, doing good deeds is a reward. You know what else is a reward? Being able to go home to a home where there's food and your children are safe and educated and cared for and you are safe and cared for. Rewards for doing the right thing shouldn't be applause and social media moments. It should be cold, hard cash. It should be after this moment is over, recognizing the value of these jobs and making sure living wages are being paid to people at every aspect of society. And that, you know, if we have to resort to something like a universal basic income, instead of saying, oh, those people, we realize we are those people. Which is a nice segue into um, the essay that I guess sets the tone for the, for the, for the book, which is Solidarity is for White Women. Um, and this argument that, you know, you raise, which is the, the failures of mainstream feminism, um, I think in recent weeks there's been a lot of critiquing around, you know, the demise of the girl boss and all of that. And, 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 and your argument is that mainstream feminism has been too focused on, you know, the gender pay gaps and those sorts of things when most women can't even get a job and most women can't put food on the table. Um, and, I, and I was hoping that you might be able to elaborate on that a little bit more. You know, this idea that when we talk about feminism, um, there's certain, there's, there's one conversation happening on the other, on one side, and there's a clearly very different reality, lived reality for so many other women. So one of the things, and part of why I talk a lot about intersectionality, um, Professor Crenshaw's work centered on black women in the criminal justice system and how their race and their gender impacted how they were treated by a system that was theoretically blind, but in actuality was biased by this idea that if you were, there's a saying here, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, get back, Jack. And what that translated to was that if you were a darker skin tone, if you didn't present well in court, didn't code switch well, you might face a longer sentence. You might face a harsher sentence than you otherwise would have. And that's true throughout our system. So when we're talking globally, what we're seeing happen is that we're saying, well, I'm not making as much as my oppressor. And it's true. It's, wage gaps are important. Wealth gaps are important. I'm not going to say that they're not. But it's very difficult when, let's say, a indigenous woman in America is making something like 47 or 50 cents to the dollar that a, a white man is earning, for her to feel bad for someone who's making, say, 75 cents to that dollar because she can't even afford to survive and they can afford to survive even if they can't afford what he can afford kind of a thing, right? So as we're going through that, that structure of, of wealth gaps and, and inequality, and then you say, well, I majored in STEM, I majored in the right things. Well, how did you have access to the education that made it possible for you to major in those things, right? Because none of us is getting to success easily, the playing field isn't level, the playing field is tilted. And intersectionality kind of stacks up in a way, especially for women, where your race dictates how much of an axis you're on, how much that tilt is. How far up are you going to have to climb to get to here, right? So if you're down here and you got to climb this far to get to here, you may not make it because then there's all those obstacles along the way. And it's not that your identity is an obstacle, it's that the, op the obstacles are created by other people in response to your identity. And so I think it's really important as we're looking at this that we talk about, you know, we can't say black lives matter, I mean only some black lives matter. We can't say that 
we care so much about our frontline workers, but what we mean is we care about the work that they do, not about the quality of their lives, or in some cases, frankly, the length of their lives. And we also can't say, oh, well, I just don't know how to fix this problem. Well, we do know. We know that leveling that playing field so that you, you here and you here are instead here, right? Even if your journey is from over here to this, at least you're not also climbing up here. Right. And the best thing would be for everyone to start from an even place. But if we can't get there first, we can at least reduce this access. Right. We can at least make this physical possible. And so that's one of the reasons that when, we're, when I talk in the book about this, I think that people think, well, we fixed this one problem. In our case, it was the end of slavery. Therefore, everything else is fixed. Well, we just move the obstacles to a new place. And I, I've noticed that. In Australian history, much of the same thing has happened with indigenous nations and the barriers to success. And then the narrative is that, well, they're not trying hard enough. You can't put somebody so far behind the eight ball that all they have are bad choices and then be upset they're not making good choices. Mm. One of the things that you also critique in the book, which I found very interesting, I mean, I, I, mean, I identify with feminist politics in, in to a certain point, and to a certain point is that in, in Australia, generally the conversation around feminism is around these gender pay gaps, is around International Women's Day breakfast, is around things that just don't relate to my life or my existence, right? Or, or, or women like me or, or, or women that um, are trying to make their way through through the world in, in this context. And so I've always identified as a womanist. And what I found very interesting about um, what you write is that womanism in, 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 in many ways also falls short. Um, and it was a very interesting thing reflecting on, um, you know, uh, how sometimes um, certain movements can overlook um, groups of people with, within that. And I, and I was hoping that perhaps you could also elaborate a little bit on that and, 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 and how you got to that to that position. So one of the things I think it's important to say here is that trans women are women, that non-binary and genderqueer and people who identify as femme shouldn't be excluded from feminist work, right? If we're going to say as a movement that we're fighting for equality, that means we've got to fight for everyone's jobs to be protected, for everyone to have access to what they need, things like that. And in that same vein, with womanism, womanism didn't necessarily address the fact of gender as a spectrum, right? It was more so gender as binary still. And that's understandable because in some ways, womanism is very reactionary to the events of the time. It's just that as we know better, we have to do better. And so now, as you said, feminism is talking about Women's Day. Um, here, it was a lot of things about whether or not to change your last name in marriage. I have no idea why I would care about that in somebody else's life. And so, you know, but meanwhile, people are dying. Women are dying. Trans women are being killed. Cis women of color are being murdered, right? And I just don't care about your last name as much as I care about missing and murdered indigenous women, missing and murdered black girls, missing and, and murdered um, trans, you know, workers and all of these things. Because if you're telling me the biggest concern in your life is whether or not you're making another 25 cents. I mean, that's great. I hope you get to be a CEO someday, if that's really what you're chasing. But I'm kind of busy trying to survive. I'm kind of busy trying to make sure other people like me can survive and then thrive, right? And I understand the girl boss narrative, but we don't talk about girl bosses in terms of what they have the power to do for people who are not themselves. It's, you're chasing power, wonderful. To do what with it? And if that isn't to make things better for other women, then are you really a being a feminist? You know, when I'm critiquing womanism, at least womanism has a concept of community. Unfortunately, a lot of mainstream modern feminism is very individually focused. And I'm not saying individuals should want to succeed, but you shouldn't be thinking, well, I've got mine, so psh, you'll figure yours out. Mm. It's interesting that you say that because I'm I'm thinking about a, a conversation that's happening in Australia at the moment. So we had a female prime minister. We had our first female prime minister a few years ago, um, and she 
um, considers herself, describes herself as a feminist, and, and, and she is. Um, and she's written a book recently that really speaks to, you know, uh, feminism and uh, these, these barriers to leadership and success, basically. Um, and one of the things that I find very interesting in the conversation around her feminist politics has been literal critique around the fact that when she was in power as the Prime Minister, a lot of the policies that were enacted impacted women the worst, you know, particularly when it came to things like paid parental leave and things like that. And I, and I wonder why does that discrepancy happen when you do have, you know, women that do make it to the top, their heads, their CEOs, of big corporations, um, but yet their employers don't have access to, um, you know, healthcare or you know access to paid maternity leave, for example. Like, like, why does that discrepancy happen? I mean, you, t- you touch on power, but I wonder if you could just expand on on that and 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 why, you know, when thinking about these things, it's a, it's it's, it's you, you have to kind of separate the two. So one of the things that mainstream feminist voices currently focus on is equality with white men, right? Equality with these people in positions of power. And what they're really saying is I want to be equal to the oppressors so I can be an oppressor too, as opposed to I want to change this system so no one is oppressed. And that isn't necessarily a comfortable thing to hear, but if your focus in being a girl boss is I want to be a CEO just like him, and he doesn't pay his workers a living wage and his shareholders are happy because they're making millions at the expense of workers, then you want to be like Lex Luthor, right? You, you want to be the villain of the story, whether that's what you tell yourself or not, because you've told yourself that your individual success matters more than anything else. And we've seen this over and over with women who are seeking power at the expense of others. Doesn't mean every woman that seeks power is necessarily not thinking about community. We've also seen women, particularly women of color who are achieving some measure of power in certain systems, use that power to benefit their communities. But what we largely see in girl boss wannabe CEO narratives is a focus on getting to the top at all costs. And we don't ever see in mainstream feminism, as you said, it's about International Women's Day and making more money and you don't even hear a discussion of what to do with the power once you get it. You hear a lot about getting power, right? Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In talks a lot about how to get to the top. That book doesn't talk about how to be a good boss, how to be good to your employees. It just talks about how you can get where you want to go. I'm thinking about what you were saying, and again, I'm just aware that you know a large part of the audience will will be will be Australian um, in, into this conversation. And when I think about the statistics, and this is obviously not going to surprise you, you know, Indigenous women in this country are overrepresented in statistics when it comes to missing people, um, overrepresented, and I think uh, rep- represent at the moment one of the fastest growing incarcerated group in the country. Um, when you look at uh, maternal mortality, um, overrepresented there again, doesn't, isn't surprising. And the thing that is increasingly frustrating for me is how mainstream feminism continues to overlook these issues and continues to overlook these conversations as though these conversations are just for um, Indigenous communities to tackle on their own, as though they're not part of the broader conversation. And, and I wonder why, why do these blind spots keep happening when the evidence is incredibly overwhelming? <laughs> as you say, people are dying as a result of, 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 of these policies. So racism is a hell of a drug. White supremacy is intoxicating. And I'm going to say these things this way because what we are seeing and what was a problem from the beginning, from foundational parts of the feminist movement as we know it today, is that the people who had the most time, the most privilege to engage in these things were also, frankly, often incredibly racist. And they brought in other racist white women. And even though now it's not so cool to be publicly racist, I can read you quotes of various mainstream major historical white feminists who were pro-lynching, pro, you know, classifying indigenous women in Australia and and, and the stolen generation and all of these things, they were gonna rescue people. 
Well, feminism never got over that. It never engaged with and addressed those beliefs. And it continues to say those people and then insist, I'm not racist. I, individual feminist, or I as a movement, not racist. But gun violence isn't an issue. It's an issue that affects Black people. It's an issue that affects Indigenous people. It's an issue that affects... And then when you point out that those people include women, you can almost hear the record scratch in their head because they think of black and brown women as being somehow completely separate. They think of low income women as being completely separate as though we have now crossed into a separate class of womanhood whose problems are for someone to deal with as a savior eventually, but certainly we don't need to do anything to help them right now because we're not where we want to be. It's a selfish, self-centered sort of focus that is only possible when you think that other women who are not like you are also not as human as you, are not as worthwhile as you. That's one of the reasons in the book I talk about respectability and how it's a trap. If we can say that some women don't deserve to be valued at any point, then we're saying we're okay with the fact that some women will be thrown away, will be killed, will be sacrificed on the altar of our success, those of us who are not the ones in danger. I want to also just touch on some of the issues that you address in terms of how mainstream um, feminism overlooks certain issues. So whether it's housing, um, food security, I found your essay on food security and hunger to be incredibly um, interesting. And, and it was so obvious. It's like, of course, you know, this, this is very much a feminist issue. Why is it important that we look at these issues from a feminist lens? You know, why is it important that when we're talking about poverty, education, housing, um, that, that is, that, that's, that's, that's how we are interrogating these issues? So women make up collectively 51% of the world's population. If all 51% of us are actually working together to benefit all 51% of us with our various governments and our various communities, there's a lot we could get done. We've definitely seen plenty happen for those who have the most power and privilege granted to them by the support of the other, the rest of the 51%, right? So if we make housing and hunger and, and poverty and all of these things and gun violence, feminist issues and feminism joins in in tackling those issues alongside the people who are already tackled, many of whom are black and brown feminists, then we come to a place where perhaps we actually make a government do something effective, right? Where you can say that the people in the towers in Melbourne during this shelter in place are getting their needs met without having to be at risk and without being shamed for having more needs than say someone that's living in a semi-detached or a fully detached home um, with a big yard and is comfortable because they can go outside and these people are kind of trapped inside. Like these are things to really think about in a meaningful way as feminist issues because the people in the buildings where the poorest people live, those are still in there. We can't say that they don't count, that their families don't count because they aren't as capable of being involved in every conversation because they're busy trying to survive. We can't expect people to fight for their rights if they're just fighting to survive. So we have to make it possible for everyone to be able to fight in the first place. And if we make things better for those with the least, it actually gets better for everyone else. You lose absolutely nothing by making sure everyone has enough food and, and safe housing and medical care. As a society, we lose nothing by ending poverty. We gain, actually, by creating a structure where people are cared for and we are able to age well in place to care for essential workers, to be essential workers, and feel like the people you are caring for care for you and the, the future of your family. Mm. One of the essays that resonated deeply with me was um, It's Raining Patriarchy, um, because this really made me think about, you know, the, the, the conversations I have within my own family, particularly with the men in my family, and how, similar to you, you know, it's, it's um, when, you, you know, you can, you can have these conversations, but breaking um, 
uh, or trying to sort of have uh, those conversations within that cultural context is just a little bit more challenging. And I was thinking about it, I was thinking about that essay in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, and, and thinking about how, you know, I don't know how many days it has been now since the campaign started about, you know, bringing Brianna Taylor's um, uh, killers to justice. Um, but also when I think about the, 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 the fact that, you know, there's within the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, lots of trans activists are sort of saying, you know, you know we have to also think about, you know, trans people and, and, and you know, that it's, that it's not just black men that are being killed by police. And I wonder, you know, these are, for me, I feel like these are very difficult conversations to have, particularly within a family context when you are trying to break um, generational views, uh, patriarchal views. How, how, how do we, you know, start, you know, within our own communities to un unpacking some of these sorts of, some of these sorts of things? So one of the things I like to do is ask people, so I have, I have two sons and they have their friends and all of that. And I start to ask questions first because sometimes people don't know why they believe what they believe. That's just what they've always been told. They've never really had to think past what has been passed down to them. So why do you think that only black men are first? Well, I see, you know, whatever the answer is. And then you say, okay, but what about, and you, you know, can name names. And then you ask them how many people, how many women, how many trans people is it before we admit that these lives are at risk too? And often the knee jerk is to say, well, well, more of us. And it's like, well, yes, yes, more black men. But if we make it safe for black women and black men and black trans folks all at the same time, is that a bad thing? Or is that, isn't that the goal, that we're supposed to be ending this happening to anyone? That we remove the power from police for them to be judge, jury, and executioner in apparently a heartbeat in the U.S. And when you start to kind of delve into that, into why they feel that way, into why they think that way, often A, they don't have great answers and they start to figure that part out. And B, as they think about it, they start to realize that they sound like the oppressors that they are fighting against. And it's slow and it's aggravating and not everybody is going to get it. But sometimes if it's someone you love who you genuinely think, genuinely believe doesn't mean any harm, then it's worth doing the work. And I'm not saying that the work is easy. I'm not saying the work is always rewarding. Sometimes there are going to be people you have to just be like, okay, well, you're not going to make it because I, I don't have the energy to unpack everything that's wrong. But if you can put people on the right path, if you can make people think about why they believe what they believe and why that system that they are defending, you know, a thing here that comes up a lot and when we're talking about rape culture is I compare the, well, why was she there and what was she wearing? To, well, he had on a hoodie and his pants were sagging. And you can almost see the light go on for some people, right? Like you can almost see that, that flick in their brain. They're like, oh, people talk about me that way. Oh, I don't like that. And then you kind of go from there. Um, and I'm not saying this work you want to do with everybody you ever meet. Tackling the patriarchy is a generationally long process will probably still be un, un, you know, having these conversations with elders and trying not to pass it down to our children for five more generations. But it took 2,000 years to build. We can't undo it in five minutes. Something that you write um, quite beautifully at the start of the book is around um, your grandmother and you, and you touch on how she wouldn't necessarily um, identify as a feminist. Um, and you talk about that evolution of feminism being around choices, and 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 I'm and I'm interested in 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 that perspective because I'm sort of when I think about um, the things that my grandmother would have wanted for me. My grandmother couldn't read or write in English, and so she, you know, her dreams for me in many ways were just around the basic things, you know, getting married to someone that that was kind and and, and lovely and. Um, possibly getting a job, but that was the limitation of what she thought um, freedom was for me in many ways, right? Um, but I also know that having that conversation with, um, you know, friends of mine that aren't necessarily black, 
that seems as though it's a very limited choice, you know, like why, why wouldn't she want more for you when, you know, these days you're, you're told that the sky's the limit. And there was something that interesting that you, that you talk, you, you touch on and it's this idea of the choices that are made available to people and not being able to recognize that, that the privilege to have choices in itself um, is not given to everyone, right? And, and thinking about that in the context of what you wrote really helped me um, make sense of, 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 of that part of, of, of my relationship with my, with my grandmother. Yeah, and see, because I'm in a place that my grandmother never could have imagined, right? I am, my grandma was born in 1924. She died before we even got to streaming services as a normal, regular thing. So I can't say, well, why was her view so limited when really she had a window that metaphorically was this wide and it had bars on it, right? And those bars were really closely packed together in that narrow window that she has, right? Like my fingers. And now my window is like this. And I'm strong enough to bend some bars, but also the bars are further apart in their center, right? And I think that it's hard for people to understand when they, their windows were, again, their windows were up here and easy to climb through, that down here where the fan starts, right? Your fingers are closer together at the bottom, right? If you're trying to climb through this space, it's much more difficult than climbing through this space. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important that we understand that when we're talking to our elders, we're talking about our elders, they did the best they could at the time that they were facing, right? Um, I'm never going to say, okay, boomer, to a black elder in my community, because my elders who were boomers, first of all, I'm never going to say that to an elder, because I like my head where it is. But second of all, they gave us the civil rights movement. Who am Mm -hmm. I to say to people that live through Jim Crow, that they didn't do enough, that they didn't try hard enough. They were facing obstacles that I'm not. And they tore those obstacles down to give me a chance to, yes, they couldn't get rid of all the obstacles, this is true, but they tore them down to give me a chance to fight my own battles, to seek my own you know, future. My great grandmother was the first person and woman in our family to legally be able to read. It was actually illegal for her mother to read and write. I have a college degree. I have two, actually. I got there. You got where you are because of what they sacrificed to boost us up. So I think for a lot of people who are outside of that paradigm, we have to sometimes say to them, I understand that your mother's biggest concern was whether or not she had a maid. But my ancestors would have been the maid. So maybe we don't need to talk about what our ancestors should have, could have, would have. Maybe we need to talk about what we have in front of us and respect that they face very different obstacles to their success. Yeah. I love what you say as well about um, education and the fact that obviously um, we live at a time where you do have the choice to take on a tertiary education but that choice to not <laughs> pursue a tertiary education is not one that's on the table. And that so resonated with me because I just sort of thought there's no way my parents would let me go through life <laughs> without, because, because they would have just gone, look at how far we've come. There is just no way that, you know, you, you, you're you not um, you making the most of this opportunity because obviously that opportunity then opens up doors. And, and for me, in many ways, it just means that, you know, you, you break that cycle of poverty, really. Um, but it's, it's, it's also a difficult one to have that conversation again, because, you know, for a lot of my non-white friends, that's something that is, yeah, it's a choice. It's like, I don't really have to go to university and my life might turn out okay. Whereas I can't necessarily say that that's going to be the case for me if I don't go to university. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. Well, and that's the thing, right? When I asked my grandmother, it was a casual, like, you know, they have this program now where I could get my GED, which is a high school diploma equivalent. And then I wouldn't have to go to my last year of high school. (sighs) Never tell a woman who lives through Jim Crow that you don't want to finish school. Let me tell you. First of all, I didn't know she could move that fast. Second of all, I didn't know she was that strong. (laughs) I I, I really think I got got a master's degree just to make sure. Just let's just be certain. (laughs) You don't show up one day. 
Um, and so, but so I think that that is the thing. It's a marker of privilege to know that you have, and we've seen this, we have the stats um, that show that a black person with a college degree is still less likely to get a job than a white person with a criminal record. You cannot say that that is, oh, well, you don't need this degree. No, I need it. You may not need it, but those of us with this as the external, we, we need it. This may not. So where do we, given everything that um, we're experiencing during these extraordinary times, where, where does feminism go? I mean, you've clearly laid out um, arguments that, that argue that the way that it's currently working is not, it's not, it's just not working, it's not helping enough women. Um, so which way forward, you know? Um, I would argue, especially right now, we're in the middle of a moment where a lot of things are on a fulcrum, right? And we can make a decision which way we're going to go. I would argue that right now, feminism's way forward is to focus on the basics and access to the basics. And I argue that because we are going to see, unfortunately, a lot of women, A, pushed out of the workforce by childcare issues and by the job losses that are happening, and B, because this pandemic is not as bad as it could be. It's not the apocalypse unless we make it one. But if we have another situation like this and we haven't fixed these systems, that we now know for sure are broken, not that we didn't know before, but it's very obvious, I would argue right now, that all of these things are broken. If feminism isn't focused on making things better going forward, then feminism will have failed not just women of color, it will have failed white women. It will have failed all of us. And I think that that has got to be a seminal change, and not just in feminism and, and our cultures in general, but specifically in feminism, because again, 51% of the world's population. We can be making some decisions to make sure that things are better for all of us in every place if we do think in terms of the collective good as opposed to the individual success. I know someone's gonna say socialism when they watch this in America, and I'm gonna point out once again that, you know, other countries have socialized medicine, which means they can go to the doctor right now while we can't. And secondly, our roads and schools and our libraries are socialism. You like socialism, you just don't know. Okay, sorry, I just had to put it in there. <laughs> That's great. Um, I could keep talking to you forever, Mickey, but I feel like we're out of time. Um, so thank you so much for being so generous with um, not just your knowledge and your words, um, but just being able to sort of just contextualize everything for Australian audiences as well, um, which has just been so wonderful and thoughtful of you. So thank you so much for taking the time. Really appreciated it. Thank you again for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Hopefully next time I can come see you in person. That would actually be really, really good. Um, it'd be great to see you in person and to yeah, show you around, particularly in Melbourne. I don't know if you've been to Melbourne before. Yes. You have not. It is a good city. <laughs> It's, it's the best city, really. Um, I know that everyone else has other views, but in, in my humble opinion, um, it's the best part of the country. So we look forward to welcoming you properly, um, hopefully once the pandemic is over and life returns to some version of normal. Um, but, so. yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you.